right, so let's start with the first question, okay? Dave, we were talking about hacking eyesight and hacking hearing. Why you believe that we can actually take our eyesight, which might be astigmatism or myopic, and heal it instantly with the right techniques. Let's talk about that. What would we do for those of us here who want to hack eyesight? Well, it just so happens that I had LASIK surgery. That's one way to do it. I actually don't recommend you get that. I, I wish I hadn't done it because there's a better way. After 10 or so years of that kind of, of surgery, my vision had gone to about 2080 in my eyes, and I had an astigmatism in one eye. You know, time to get glasses and all that kind of stuff. Or I did something called developmental ophthalmology. And I spent one hour every Saturday morning for three months, plus a few other minutes during the week, doing eye training and strengthening and flexibility exercises. And I got rid of my astigmatism, and I brought myself back to 2020. There's a couple of books you could read, Yoga for Your Eyes by Meyer Schneier, and there's something called the Bates Method, which is, for some reason, Wikipedia is, like, is opposed to a lot of things that work if it's not like paid for by Monsanto and, and that sort of thing. Uh, unfortunately, there's been a bit of censorship there. But the Bates Method does work, and it's, it's not uh, complimented on Wikipedia, but I'll be damned if it doesn't work you can find a developmental ophthalmologist, and what they do is they teach your brain to interpret your vision differently. It's absolutely doable, I did it, and it changed things. And Bates is spelled B-A-T-E-S, the yes. Bates method. Mm -hmm. Okay, and development ophthalmology, that's something else you guys can Google. The, the second one, though, and I still have 30 seconds left, yeah. is hearing. If you see a qualified audiologist, they can measure not just can you hear the dog sounds, you know, the really high pitch, really low pitch, which we've all heard, it turns out there's many nuances in your hearing. And what I did is I went in, they do something called auditory integration training, and runs about between $1,000 and $3,000. They get a very fine map of what frequencies each ear can hear. And there are some frequencies that are harder to hear in your left ear versus your right ear. Then they make a special CD for you where they take Mozart and they cut out the parts of Mozart that would be hard for you to hear, so there's nothing there at all and then you listen to this for a while. It makes you feel really odd when you do it, and the music sounds muddy and weird. But what it does is it makes your brain pay more attention to the parts where it's weak, and it actually fills in the gaps. Isn't this awesome? Yeah. Wow. Like, what, what do we Google to find that? Uh, auditory integration training. Auditory integration mm -hmm. training. Okay, let's, let's go for something a little bit more impolite. So is it okay if we bring up some of the stuff that we share in our private conversations? Sure. All right, let's talk about that I do time. think you're cute, Vision. Thank you. <laughs> Let's, let's talk about that time you stuck four injections in your penis. You saw the video, was it all right? <laughs> so explain, explain to us. The video didn't actually show anything. So recently... Well, I, well, explain to them the toe thing in the video. All right. So, we'll, we'll tell them what we did, and then right. we'll, I'll do the toe sure. demo. So... <laughs> I... Went to Park City with my wife, and we had our bone marrow tapped and some fat taken out, and they pulled the, the stem cells out of this. And I had the stem cells injected pretty much everywhere I could think to have them injected. Uh, so around my face, hair, all, every old injury I have, and well, we had some extra stem cells, and well, there's this thing called the P shot. They inject it into the organ that starts with a P. And there's the equivalent for the woman called the O-shot. And this is some powerful medicine. And in the video, I'm shooting myself. I'm laying on this, this, this table. And you see just the blanket. And then you see a needle come down beyond the blanket. And you see my feet there. I'm wearing my ugly shoes so I can show this. And then all of a sudden, when the needle hits, my toes go, wing! <laughs> so it's a powerful but, uh, video. Because everyone who sees it, especially guys, are like, <laughs> But, so, but it creates what, youthful vigor? Is that the yeah, So what exactly did that do? <laughs> <laughs> well, they actually talk about improvements in length and girth, and uh, my new nickname is, is Tripod. <laughs> no, it... It's hard to say what it's like to be a teenager again, but it's kind of like that. The, the effect actually on, uh, on my wife was even more profound. Um, we were talking about toes earlier. 
when you had a certain point in life and you had a couple kids, like, toes don't curl? Well, with stem cells, they curl again. <laughs> Brilliant. So you guys know where you're going after Mykonos. <laughs> Let's talk about smart drugs. All right. What are your favorite, favorite smart drugs? And, and first, let's define what a smart drug is. There's a, a term called, uh, well, actually, we'll just talk about smart drugs, but, but there's a bunch of, of other internet companies talking about nootropics and things like that. The term nootropic is a, a classical term for both drugs and natural substances that increase cognitive function. <laughs> And smart drugs are just the pharmaceuticals. When I was working full time at a startup, we ended up selling this startup in Silicon Valley for about $600 million in value. I was also getting my MBA at Wharton at a program that was the number of hours of a full time program. It was an executive thing. So they flew the professors to you so you didn't have to go to the professors, which was convenient. And I was probably not going to finish the program because my brain would not work. I just I didn't understand I was dealing with environmental toxins, I was eating some foods that were not compatible with me, and I was pushing, my, my pedal was, my foot was all the way on the accelerator, I was pushing the pedal through the floor, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't bring it anymore. I'd sit there for tests and there was just nothing happening. So I got brain scans from Daniel Amen and realized there's no, no metabolic activity in my prefrontal cortex, which was cool, because that day it went from being a, a moral failing to being a biological issue that I could hack. And that was one of the things that turned me into a biohacker. But the first thing I did is I said, all right, I'm gonna order every smart drug possible from Europe. So I, I researched smart drugs, and I ordered uh, $500 worth of things like aniracetam and hydrogen. But the big gun is one Limitless the movie is based on. It's called Modafinil. And I've been on ABC Nightline and CNN and most of the other big networks talking about this because I was one of the first executives, probably to put it in my LinkedIn profile, at, at Wharton, I'm like, guys, um, I'm doping. <laughs> Here's the smart drugs I'm taking. <laughs> it's not illegal, and I'll give you some if you want, but this is what I'm doing. So modafinil for eight years absolutely changed my and life. And modafinil, I know, was just approved by the FDA. Oh, no, it's been around since a long yeah. time. So is this something you'd recommend for people here? If you have not tried modafinil on a, for at least occasional basis, if you get jet lagged or you ever have a time in your life when you need to bring it, no matter what, or you need to drive and not drive off the road and die, you should have a modafinil in your purse or in your man purse or whatever the heck you carry. The, it, it's a safety thing for driving and for those things. And also, if you're gonna fly around the world and give a keynote presentation and you get there and you're a zombie and you're like, I, I think I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna stutter, I'm just not gonna bring it, if you have modafinil in your bag, and some of the other biohacks too, like, like I, I, I've been off modafinil for three plus years now because I don't need it anymore. Like I run this way without that drug. But for eight years, it was 50% of my mm -hmm. performance when I started taking it. I would not have an Ivy League MBA. I would not probably not have had a lot of the jobs I've had without modafinil. So I recommend that you have access to it. I'll warn you, five out of a million people can get a life-threatening autoimmune reaction. It's the same one caused by ibuprofen with about the same risk level, but there is, it's not risk-free, but it's relatively low risk in the overall scheme of things. And on my blog, I tell you which genetic variants are associated with that. So if you're really worried about the five out of a million kind of risk, you could look at your 23andMe, get a genetic test, and then make sure that you're not one of those people. So I would say yes with that caveat, which is very small. It's worth trying, and some of you will just get headaches from it, but for those of you who get the Oh my God, it makes you a lot more of whatever you are. If you're a dick, it'll make you a big dick. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you said you got off modafinil, right? And, uh, yeah. and I know you're doing a lot of things right now. Um, many people know about the Bulletproof Coffee brand, which is huge, but there's also that other brand, 40 Years of Zen. Let's talk about both of them. First, let's talk about Bulletproof Coffee and what is it about and why are fats so important? So Bulletproof Coffee came about when I went to to bed. I spent three months in Asia. After I got my MBA, I got divorced from a, a bad marriage. And I'm like, you know, for the first time in my adult life, I'm just going to go travel by myself. And I wanted to learn meditation from the masters. So I went to Tibet, where the masters are, <laughs> and realized there were actually more of them in Nepal. So I did some meditation courses in Nepal. But I wanted to go to Mount Kailash, which is in very remote western Tibet. It's the headwaters for the Ganges and Indus rivers. And it's where Buddhists and Hindus believe the gods reside on this mountain. It's never been climbed. But what you do is 
if you're saying during summer, you walk in a circle up to 18,000 feet, uh, about 26 miles of rugged trail, and you, you're supposed to walk around it three times. I just did one time, but it was, it's, it's like a spiritual pilgrimage thing. The problem was it was way after tourist season. It was 10 degrees below zero, and when you're at altitude like that, you feel like crap. I've done high altitude mountaineering. I, I really enjoy it, and I was expecting to feel like a zombie, and this little Tibetan lady gives me a bowl of tea, yak butter tea, and I drank it and was like, what just happened? I drank like 20 more of those every day, and I performed better than I ever expected, and I came back and started trying to replicate that. And after thousands of tests and iterations, the formula is bulletproof coffee beans, where we change the coffee to not have stuff that makes you jittery and anxious, because jittery and anxious is the opposite of high performing. Uh, so there's a special process for the coffee. It's grass-fed butter, and it's an oil called brine octane, which is distilled from coconut oil. It's kind of, if coconut oil is weak beer, this is Everclear or vodka. Like, like, it raises ketones in the body in a way that changes hormones so you don't care about food. It has other energizing effects. So you blend these things together, you drink it, and you feel very, very different right away. So that's the bulletproof coffee side of things. And you were asking about also 40 years of Zen? Or? About fats. Why? Fats. Why? What is this about fats? There's this whole conversation right now where fats are good and sugar is bad. Well, I wish it was that easy. Some fats are bad. And that's why when you see these, uh, these, these questionable things about fat, you can take hydrogenated fat. You can take the, the seed oils, canola oil, and corn oil, and things like that, and those are actually not good for you. So the idea that proteins good or bad or fats good or bad, it, it's a big question of which fats are good or bad. And what research is showing is that more of the right kinds of fat give you more energy. And when I say give you more energy, when you digest a gram of fat, it has more calories in it, right? Like compared to sugar? Guess what a calorie is? It's energy. Guess what happens when your brain has enough energy? You're happy and satisfied and full and you want to go kick ass. Guess what happens when you burn sugar? Well, you get less energy per gram, and your body gets hungry very quickly, and it's not happy, it's not satisfied, and it's not full of energy. Instead, it's seeking more sugar. So the idea is actually calories are not bad for you. Calories do not by themselves make you fat. Calories actually give you energy. So when you're getting your calories from the right kinds of fat, you're less inflamed, you have less cravings, your hormones work much better, your cells are all made out of fat, your brain is made out of fat, you don't make testosterone or estrogen or progesterone without fat, so we need it. And we were lied to by some well-meaning but really pretty inexperienced uh, researchers starting around the year I was born, around 1970, is when we started to just go off the rails nutritionally. A 28-year-old nutritionist who had never treated one obese person made up the idea that fat makes you fat, gave it straight to the government, they spread the idea, and ever since then, if you say any, anything to disagree with it, they just kill your career in academia. That's over. <laughs> the internet has changed things. Uh, so let's talk about, let's talk about your, ex your experiments with, and what I like about Dave is it's not just about biohacking. Dave is also big on hacking consciousness. Let's talk about 40 years of Zen. Tell us what is that and what impact did it have on you? What did you get from meditating for 10 weeks with your brain hooked up to machines? 40 years of Zen is a, a structured program where you go in for, for five days and glue electrodes to your head and then learn what's going on inside your head. The first thing you learn is how do I raise my alpha brain waves, which is correlated with this heart opening experience. When you're in a kind of a, a jittery focused athletic state, you're more in beta. When you're in a meditative state, or one of the meditative states, you're in alpha. And you do this by sitting in a dark room, eyes closed, listening to sounds. And the sounds are your brain waves. It, it's a direct interface to your brain. The only problem is that then we give you a challenge. And the challenge is make the sounds louder. And after a little while, you realize that's hard. So then it comes the hard work. And the hard work is the sounds only get louder when you change your rule. <laughs> you have a bullshit rule that you got somewhere, and it's almost always from a trauma or from someone that you're holding a grudge against. So you go through this process of radical forgiveness, the one that, that you've, mm -hmm. you've got in your book. And during this process, if you forgive something right, the sounds get louder. If you don't forgive something and you tell yourself you forgave something, the sounds don't get louder. 
So what it really rapidly becomes is a kind of meditation around uh, forgiveness. Developing a forgiveness practice is a whole focus of major arms of meditation. The problem is that you never know if you did it right. So there's people, oh yeah, I forgave mom. Like, no, you didn't. Like, put up a lie detector on your, on your thing and then say, I forgive mom. And the lie detector's like, no, you didn't. And you're like, well, I don't understand what's going on. And then you do the digging. And what ends up happening when you do this is all of those automated rules that we talked about earlier, the meat operating system, well, they were set by something. It wasn't you who set them, it was the environment who set them. But you have the power with this kind of technology to go in and change what your body believes happened. So the reason the voice in my head shut up is that I went through and I forgave all of the people that my nervous system was mad at. I wasn't even mad at some of them. I'm like, I'm done with that, I don't care. Well, my body cared. So you end up communicating better with the body and the mind. And that's changed yeah. everything for me. Brilliant stuff, and I can vouch for that. I did, I did the same thing with Dave. JJ was there as well, and you had to go through radical forgiveness. And in the end, your brain waves just change. Yeah. And when you come out of it, it changes the way you live life. It changes the way you view things. You feel, you feel as if you've just went through two or three years in growth, in wisdom, and in brain power. So it was really amazing. But tell them, you told me something, and I don't know if this is public, uh, but you told me about how if it wasn't for 40 years of Zen, you wouldn't be where you are today because it changed you that much. Every day, thousands of times, you will check yourself. And there are, are countless decisions you make. There's two forks in the road, or maybe there's no forks, and you have to come up with the forks. Well, if you can tilt the odds in your favor, even just a little bit, it changes things radically. But what normally happens is we have hardwired behaviors that we'll do. They're invisible to us, but they affect us in business. They affect us especially in relationships. And you don't see them. The reason you don't see them is the same reason that when you pull your hand off the hot stove, you didn't think about it. You just pulled your hand off the hot stove, and you assumed that there was a reason you did it because the stove was hot. You, you, if some, someone else was driving when that happened. What ends up happening is you become aware of that part of you who's driving, and it stops being able to drive. And that's why I can grow bulletproof the way I do. And, and people are saying, well, how, how are you doing all this? How, how do you reach all these places? How do you do all these things? I'm like, because those three Fs, like, I own those bitches. And that's what it came down to, is, is the fear, I, I own that fear. Like, like, if I feel fear, like, all right, whatever. <laughs> I'm not going to die. Uh, and I can turn it off. And... The food thing, I, I can fast for 72 hours. I might get a little tired, but there is no I'm going to starve to death instinct left from that kind of thing. And on the sex thing, I can go 30 days. I'll have lots of sex or I'll have no sex, and I'm not going to die. That was the hardest one, by the way. But with all of that, like, okay, life just got a lot easier, and 40 years of Zen is at the core of all those skills. That's incredible. That's some really good stuff. Um, let's talk about a couple more things while we have two minutes left. What are your tips for exercise, because I found that to be one of the most intriguing parts of your book. You said that we do not have to spend hours at a gym, that they are optimized exercises we can do in minutes that give you the same results. Exercise is stress. And I didn't talk much about stress in, in this just today at all, but there's useful stress that causes a change, and then there's useless stress, like, oh no, I'm gonna die if I don't get the cookie. And they're both stressed, just one didn't do anything, one did. So I got rid of all the useless stress, and then when you exercise, you wanna maximize the stress in the minimum amount of time, which means lifting really, really heavy things without any rest at all, as hard as you can, even 15 minutes once a week of doing that, or sprinting until you throw up, basically. Sprint, pause, sprint, pause, sprint, pause. Do that for 15 minutes, you'll probably hurl unless you're in really good shape. That's it, you're done. You might wanna do that twice a week if you like, really wanna get in, in good shape. And you can do lots of movement. I'm not saying you don't need to move. I'm saying that was your exercise. You go for a walk, you like to go for a walk. Go for a swim, you like to go for a swim. That's not really exercise, that's just moving around. Moving around a lot is good for you, but it doesn't necessarily make you a better person if you took the stairs, you don't get exercise points. Your dumb little wrist tracker, by the way, I was CTO of one of those wrist tracking companies. Um, they actually do useful stuff, but they don't tell you how many calories you burned when you went up the stairs. That's just a myth. So what, what's going on there is high input to the system causes high adaptation. Low input to the system causes low adaptation. So you could go to the gym and I'm gonna sweat every day and you know, breathe the exhaust from the person in front of me on the little treadmill thing. 
okay, <laughs> you could. <laughs> but like, don't you have something better to do? <laughs> so basically, um, exercise routines like minimum effective dose, yeah. Tabata, high, intens high intensity training are the ones that you would recommend. Absolutely. And you can do your yoga practice or something else. I, I'm a fan of yoga. I can put my ankle behind my head and that sort of thing. Um, but that isn't necessarily your exercise. And you can get some of this from, from yoga. If you're doing a very aggressive body weight, bearing lots of handstand sort of things, that's, that's, that'll get you some of the way there, but you'll get more from very focused, very intense work. Awesome. And final question. Would you put your ankle around your head? I might knock my headset off, and I didn't warm up at all, but let me see if I can pull this off. I totally didn't warm up. I haven't stretched in, like, a while. All right. Wow. Wait, I'm going to make sure you don't fall. That's impressive, Dave. Thank you. Big round of applause to Dave Asprey. Thank you, Facebook. Awesome. All right.